All right, welcome everybody, welcome back. Great to see you all for the last time. I bet I'm feeling sadder about that than you are. Oh. <clears throat> so, um, we are uh, enormously fortunate for our last front lines of gender justice and the gender justice class session to welcome Galen Sherwin back, um, back to Columbia, who has um, returned to Columbia a number of times um, to speak as an expert since graduating from Columbia in 2003. Right. 20 years. It's been 20 years. Yeah. Um, and in that time has done amazing work in the gender justice space in a, a, a number of important capacities. So just some highlights. Um, uh, and I don't know if it was immediately after law school that you joined the uh, NICLU. So the it? Center for Reproductive Rights oh, first. Sarah. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Sarah yeah. first. Um, doing repro work, then NICLU, the New York Civil Liberties Union, doing repro work and then heading up their repro work. Moving from there to the national um, uh, in 2009, national AC, ACLU and the Women's Rights Project. Um, uh, Galen litigated the Peltier case that we read, the dress codes case um, that we talked about um, with Rhea. And you had just argued it, or were just about to argue it last year. That's right. When you were here. That's right. And um, well done. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if it holds. Well done. Yeah. Um, I, I remember mooting you for the, yes. for the argument with Caitlin Halligan. Yes. Who has just been um, elevated to the New York Court of Appeals this week, who is an amazing oralist and an, uh, will be an incredible judge. Um, and then last October, moved from the ACLU's Women's Rights Project, which Rhea is the head of, to the New York Attorney General's office, to uh, Tish James's office, and the title is the Special Counsel for Reproductive Justice, um, really leading the ways in which um, our top legal officer in the state of New York is engaging the question of reproductive justice in this, um, this time, and we were just talking out in the hall, I can't imagine being in a more important place doing important work mm -hmm. than this right now. Um, uh, it's such a critical time to be able to think about how to leverage the power of the attorney general's office, an attorney general who wants to be as aggressive, I think, as aggressive as possible, not only in defending um, reproductive justice rights in New York State for New Yorkers, but I think also in establishing New York State as a haven. Um, uh, nationally and an example nationally of what it means to really lean into the defense of reproductive justice. So um, welcome. Thank you. How is it going? Uh, it's a whirlwind. Um, <laughs> it's a big question. Yeah, it's a whirlwind, but it's, you know, it is going great. It is, things are moving very quickly. And it is a little bit like, you know, drinking from a fire hose. So yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, I'm very happy to be where I am. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a, is it just you or you must have a whole office and a team of people? So I don't actually have anybody who's a direct report. There are various special counsels in our office who basically are charged with coordinating the work of the entire office mm -hmm. on a particular subject area. So we have some folks who focus on opioids, others on gun control, you know, so issues that are top priorities for the attorney general. Yeah. Um, and so it's basically just trying to both beef up that work and sort of bring more coordination to it. And was this position in existence before or this she created this new job and then reached out to you? She created the new job just after the decision leaked and figured we're going to need extra thought put into this. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that was how it happened. And she didn't reach out to me directly, although I heard I got, you know, basically recruited by three different people who <laughs> sent me the position and said, you really need to apply for this. So yeah. um, at that point, I wasn't necessarily looking to leave the ACLU, which is a wonderful place to be. Um, but, uh, you know, this was a position that I couldn't really pass up. Yeah. Um, just uh, staying at the 30,000 level, foot level for a second, we'll come, we'll come back to the specifics of some of the litigation that you're doing right now. Um, you've worked in some of the most important nonprofits doing reproductive rights and justice work, whether it's CRR or the NICLU or the ACLU, but now you're working for the government. What, what particular advantage is there to being in the government doing this work, um, and not just any part of the government, but the law enforcement, 
mm -hmm. part of the government, the attorney general's office? What, what unique kind of powers, um, potential does that hold? It's really huge um, and, you know, definitely interesting from my perspective to be sitting on what is essentially the other side of the table. In many cases, you know, the ACLU is oftentimes suing attorneys general. Uh, in blue states, we tend to be more in a collaborative relationship, but, you know, there's also situations where we're bringing adverse litigation. So it's an interesting new perspective for me. I um, actually started my career before going to law school, working for a New York state legislator. Mm -hmm. And so this was actually a little bit like coming full circle to like be doing it from within the government. Um, but, you know, the attorney general's office has tremendous enforcement authority. And, you know, I was really pretty floored when I started to learn more about the scope of that authority. Um, you know, we can bring investigations into host of different types of activity, anything that is a repeat violation of New York law, there's basically authority for us to investigate. Um, and so that is really, really broad and gives us a handle into or hook into a lot of different areas like, you know, crisis pregnancy centers that are misleading uh, pregnant people uh, about their options or trying to steer them away from abortion care, um, you know, denials of abortion to uh, people who are incarcerated, um, all of these different areas that you can, you know, then decide to look into. So I've been working on a couple of those, and it's been really interesting to sort of approach it from that angle. And then there's also more of a um, legislative and policy piece of it. I'm sorry to have my back to you all. Um, there is a legislative and policy piece of it as well, and legislators often turn to us for advice or proposals. So I've been involved in thinking through, I've been able to be involved legislatively in thinking through what ways New York could be uh, further safeguarding or shoring up reproductive rights. And some of those measures have actually passed through the legislature and become law. Mostly they happened before I came on board. So right when I started, so in June, the legislature passed a package of bills, including what is commonly known as the shield law, but I like to call it a provider protection law because it's not a full shield and can't be a full shield against what hostile state AGs might be doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but so shield law, provider protections, funding for abortion providers, confidentiality protections for abortion providers, um, and, and a host of other um, protections. So all of those went into effect, some right away, some, right, some in January. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's sort of a phase two, I think, that we're now considering. Okay. So the shield laws are going to get, I mean, they just raise such interesting intrastate in, uh, you know, cross-state enforcement questions that are really new territory. They are. And they're going to get tested, unfortunately. Yes. Um, people will be hunted down, basically, by, by unfriendly states. What role do you see the Attorney General's office playing in, in the enforcement of the shield laws? So the shield laws are, the, the way New York chose to do it, there are various components of it. One is against a shield against licensure and disciplinary consequences of providing abortion care in New York. So basically making sure that they don't, that providers don't have their licenses threatened. Um, and that's, that does not raise any of the interstate questions because regulation of the practice of medicine and the related professions is squarely within, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the state's police authority. So that's one really important component of it that I think doesn't get discussed a lot. Um, but the concern, the bigger concern is that there will be legal action brought by hostile, either hostile attorneys general or in an SB8 type vigilante lawsuit, like, you know, in Texas against providers for providing care to people who are seeking care from states where abortion is not lawful within New York. Um, and so those laws were enacted in order to protect against New York's participation in any such hostile legal action, including, you know, enforcement of subpoenas and warrants, um, you know, uh, participation in assisting with those types of investigations. So basically state officers and uh, employees are not supposed to help with those types of investigations. Um, so in terms of how the AG's office is involved, you know, we might in some cases be asked to participate in mm -hmm. some of these types of investigations and we would not do so because the law now protects and we also would be involved in uh, defending that law against any constitutional challenge should one be, should one be brought. Mm -hmm. 
What other, what other do you think are the more effective measures that you've been able to put in place since you started that are either protecting New Yorkers, mm -hmm. full reproductive um, health care, or as I said before, providing a kind of safe haven? Yeah. So, I mean, there's discussions underway right now about expanding the scope of the provider protection law to address provision of telemedicine across state lines. And so for folks who don't know, essentially abortion can be provided by medication now, um, med medication abortion, and that can be prescribed remotely um, under changes that the FDA put into effect essentially in January, although it had been rolling out for some time, um, including as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic when everyone was using telemedicine for everything, right? And we, we saw as a nation that that could be done safely and efficiently. Um, so the question is, right now what's happening is people are providing a, a medication abortion and there are attestations that providers are having patients make that they are going to take the medication in the state of New York, that they are in the state of New York when it is prescribed and they're going to take the medication in New York. Um, because the provider protection laws that were enacted really only apply to abortion that's lawfully provided in, in New York. Um, so what does it mean to have an abortion in New York when you're taking two pills and between them, there's 72 hours, 24 to 72 hours. Um, what if you go home to say, take the second pill, you go home to the state of Texas or wherever, where does the abortion take place? So I think that this is raising all of these questions about which state's laws apply, how, how hostile states hostile to abortion can enforce their state laws outside of their borders. Um, and I think the shield laws are an attempt in the first instance to put up some bulwarks against that type of prosecution and there are now discussions underway about expanding that to uh, make clear that if the prescriber is lawfully pre prescribing an abortion and the prescriber is located in New York, then um, that would uh, then the, the protections would be triggered. Mm -hmm. The protections of this uh, protection law would be triggered. Um, so those are underway, and I think our office has been consulting about how to safeguard that bill, make sure it's as constitutionally sound as it can be. Um, other provisions that we're you know, exploring, how can we respond to the threats to medication abortion that we're seeing playing out in the courts and in the legislatures uh, in hostile states? And are there New York State, um, are there New York State responses where we can be shoring up protections as a matter of New York State law? What would that look like? Um, very much under discussion um, as things have been developing rapidly. Um, but basically we're looking at what are the areas where um, if a, if a drug is misbranded or you know its label doesn't isn't accurate because it says it's an approved drug and it is no longer an approved drug because of perhaps mm -hmm. judicial action, um, what are the repercussions under New York State law? And could there be something done as a legislative or executive matter that would clarify um, that it's still safe within New York to prescribe those medications? Mm -hmm. It's, it just raises so many interesting questions of um, state and local government law, um, where normally we would see the federal government being primary, the, the leader in regulating drugs mm -hmm. in, um, in deciding sort of the interstate commerce issues, you know, the sort of con law 101. Um, uh, and in the, in the face of this legislation or the litigation, the states are having to step up in new ways, mm -hmm. partly like good states like New York in response to what the aggressive actions were of bad states. And so do you see generally a kind of expansion of state and local government law um, necessarily mm -hmm. um, in response to you know, your jurisdiction and enforcement powers expanding because Mississippi, Texas, Florida, you, know, you name it, Idaho, mm -hmm. they're all doing such terrible things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is what Dobbs brought. Asked us to do. Yeah, yeah. it has kicked kicked it back to the states. And um, so now it is raising a host of untested questions about the scope of states' authority, choice of law, all of these questions, you know, and how it all relates to the basic constitutional protections like the Dormant Commerce Clause or, you know, um, Full Faith and Credit Clause. You know, how can we... <laughs> make sure that we're complying with those oh, that overlay of protections while at the same time trying to do everything we can within New York's authority to safeguard abortion. Yeah. So Judge Kaczmarek, <clears throat> lovely fellow down in Amarillo. Um, 
what did you what was your what, what was your reaction to um, the, the Supreme Court's ruling mm -hmm. and particularly Justice Alito's dissent? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, even though we don't know what the vote count is because you don't really have a count on the shadow docket, I think everyone was very relieved to see that there were only two justices who noted a dissent. So that is encouraging. Um, the nature of the dissent, you know, I think, came off as, you know, a cranky uh, statement about the shadow docket primarily, right, which, you know, he has not been above using himself, um, but, but, cranky, always. but you know, always crankily, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I think it is sort of shocking to suggest that there is no consequence, there would have been no consequence had the stay not been granted, because the FDA could have just ignored you know, ignored the judge's ruling. And certainly that's not how federal agencies work. It's not how the Department of Justice works, right? If they are given an injunction, they have to comply with it. And so uh, to suggest otherwise is just not grounded in reality um, and also really shocking coming from a justice of the Supreme Court. So I think there was yeah. some, it, <laughs> It was not on uh, anyone's bingo card, let's put it that way. That so, reasoning. Yeah, that reasoning, yeah. That's a quote from Greer Donnelly <laughs> on Twitter <laughs> to give credit. Well, yeah. You used it nicely. <laughs> um, uh, well, it, it it certainly was cranky. It was an, a non-legal opinion in a way. And it in the face of Merrick Garland as the, attor the attorney general or uh, yeah, the attorney general, who is so conservative as it is about law mm -hmm. and the role of the Justice Department, you know he would have advised the FDA to abide by whatever the injunction said. Right. Um, more than any attorney general I can think of in um, in recent memory, certainly more than Bill Barr and those those folks. So to suggest that somehow the court or the, the administration would not abide by the law is kind of shocking. It truly is. Yeah. I mean, and it's different, I think, not exercising enforcement authority is different in a scenario where the drug's authorization in the first instance has gone up in smoke, right? That's essentially what the very unprecedented nature of the relief that Judge Kesmeric granted was, and this was not briefed or requested by any of the parties, but he imposed a stay under Section 705 of the APA, right? Which is, you know, it's a provision that we have used in our litigation for example, against Donald Trump, um, but was not, again, wasn't on the menu, really. And, and the effect is supposed to be to pause before drastic effects of an agency action can take effect. Mm -hmm. But he's pausing 23 years later after it's taken effect. So this was a really unprecedented and, and uncharted territory that the FDA found itself in. And it was between a rock and a hard place in large part because there's also this Washington injunction, which is arguably in very extreme tension with uh, with the Texas injunction. So the Texas injunction says Mifepristone was never authorized in the first place. That authorization never happened retroactively, just like making it go away. And the Washington injunction said, FDA, you are not allowed to do any take any further steps to make Mifepristone less available or accessible. And so how are they supposed to comply with both injunctions, right? It's not, it is not possible to comply with both injunctions. And that's not a situation that as the attorney general, right, that anybody would, <laughs> they would take that straight to the Supreme Court as they did properly. And the, the court for Justice Alito's failure to grapple with that, I think was really, yeah, it's surprising. Right, because they were placed in this impossible position. Yeah. So what in your litigation practice, in your practice before taking this job and dealing in this case, were you frequently asking judges to grant national injunctions? I was not at the Women's Rights Project because a lot of my work was very local. Individual it plaintiffs. Was individual plaintiffs. Maybe there was a class case or two thrown in there. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, my work was against because it was employment discrimination and gender discrimination in education, it was really focused on like a school or a school district or yeah. a particular employer. So I was not, but my colleagues were all the time, right? Like, all so the all the time. Yeah. So in particular on LGBT issues and on reproductive rights, um, there were many requests for nationwide injunctions, immigration, you know, you sort of, you name it. 
Um, so uh, it was not part of my practice personally, but mm -hmm. definitely part of the ACLU's practice. Well. Were the, to the extent that you can say, and if this is an inappropriate question, you just tell me. Um, <laughs> Were there were there discussions within the ACLU about the wisdom of moving towards national injunctions? Because it's it, it's kind of a newish thing. Yeah, and it's one that we on the left have mostly had trouble with. Um, that it that of giving federal courts that much power right. to control the entire country, even though they only have a, either a circuit or a district in their in their technical jurisdiction, and we've we've seen it frequently on both left and right mm -hmm. and and so in the in the mifa pristone case it's a bad thing uh, because we don't agree with what what's being enjoined um or the the injunction itself but i know chase strangio and plenty of folks doing the lgbt work mm -hmm. at the aclu are more than happy to ask those mm -hmm. those national injunctions particularly with the trump administration doing such terrible things so what are there critical discussions within the ACLU about is this a politics we're okay with? Mm -hmm. You know, I doesn't I don't have to even dodge that question because I was never part of those discussions because of my answer to the previous question, which was, I, you know, I didn't really yeah. practice in that way. So I'm sure there were discussions. I wasn't party to them, so I don't really know how they played out. I am sure that, you know, it was something that they grapple with and have grappled with. Uh, and certainly there is a lot of controversy around it on both sides. Mm -hmm. I just asked because, um, you know, there's ways in which with how conservative the federal courts are now, and particularly the Supreme Court, is that we're all on the left thinking, considering seriously using um, maneuvers that are um, that are typically the maneuvers of the right, mm -hmm. because why not? I mean, w they use every tool in their toolkit shouldn't we as well but it's really holding our nose when we do it mm -hmm. whether it's religious liberty claims in the repro context or other things like that maybe even national injunctions and um and you worry that what you're doing is legitimizing a tactic that you've criticized so much mm -hmm. on the other side mm -hmm. um and 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 giving it new power mm -hmm when when we're all using it and um and the national injunction issue was one i i've been part of conversations at the center for constitutional rights about but i was wondering if if you were at, at the aclu mm -hmm. yeah. not me personally yeah. but i mean i think that if if it's if you're talking about a federal law or a federal action then and if if you're arguing that it is unconstitutional then federal relief is you know more arguably appropriate um so, yeah, yeah, okay. So let me say that I forgot my list of the folks who wrote for today. I had Lily bring it down, but she brought me the wrong folder. Um, not her fault, mine. Um, so you guys who wrote for today, please just throw your hands in the air. Okay, Nathaniel, thank you. Why don't you jump in? Uh, Ms. Sherwin, thank you for being here. Galen, <laughs> perfect. Um, so in my paper this week, I wrote a bit about duplicity on the right and among conservatives. We see it here where they discuss medication abortion as, you know, starving an unborn child. And they talk about caring about safety, you know, in these maternal care deserts. But once the child is born, and we've talked a lot these past few weeks about the child policing, family policing system, ACS. So there's a tension there. We've also talked about this issue with respect to trans rights and, you know, Republicans trying to block uh, trans people from participating in women's sports. They say it's about, you know, fairness, but it's really more about discrimination. So I was wondering, um, in your experience, uh, how do you combat that duplicity, whether it's, you know, calling it out in briefings and papers, just trying to put the right, you know, whether it's science or information out there, um, which I see you do here in the Amiki brief about how important access to this care is It really kind of shutting down some of the things that the plaintiffs and the judge himself says. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe explain, expand a bit more on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on what your forum is, right? So if you're before a court, you are always cautious and attentive to the audience, right? And we we knew who the audience was in that brief. As you can see, it's pretty straightforward, um, letting the facts speak for themselves, or that's, that's the goal, right? We're not a lot of characterization here of what you know, the plaintiffs have been doing um, or the tactics that they've been engaged in or, you know, of how bananas the Kaczmarek decision is, right? So we, we really tried to stick 
to the facts and let them speak to themselves. You know, in public, I think if you're talking about public discourse, certainly working for an elected official, she has a very large bully pulpit and she can call out, she can call BS really um, in a way uh, and does. And so that is a different forum. And, and part of her role has been to sort of just try and be a reassuring voice. <laughs> Abortion remains available and legal in New York and you know, just trying to um, dispel confusion. Um, but you know, in terms of the broader hypocrisy, <laughs> Um, you know, again, just resorting to the facts here, like these are the same people who are proposing cuts to social welfare. And it's very clear that, um, states with abortion restrictions have worse maternal health out and fetal and, and maternal and infant health outcomes. So, you know, that fact should speak for itself. Yeah. You want to follow up? Yeah, this is, um, kind of. It might be against some of the things you said before about the the tactics, but I wrote also a bit about, you know, if you were to like sue Pfizer, for example, for Viagra being, you know, mm -hmm. 10 times more dangerous than Mifepristone, um, you know, there may be like a PR impact there. There's also obviously concerns it doesn't really stop the harms affecting pregnant people now. Um, but I guess on that, assuming that's not the next step, I was wondering maybe what other litigation avenues there are that you see, whether it's defending against suits like this, or if it's something else like pushing forward, um, you know, on your own, filing your own suit. Yeah, yeah. So you probably, I, mean, I talked about the Washington case, right? Obviously there are states that are pursuing a strategy of th their strategy was try, try and get an injunction that is going to, <laughs> you know, hold up, shore up some, some rights, at least temporarily, right? Um, so that's one approach the, uh, manufacturer of the generic version has brought litigation, Gen Bio Pro has bought, brought litigation um, suing the FDA, um, arguing that the FDA, if it were to essentially withdraw or de-approve uh, de <laughs> its generic version of the drug, that would be a violation of constitutional rights to due process and of the um, FDCA, which is the you know Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, which has a statutorily mandated process for which the FDA has to go through before it can make any changes to uh, drug authorization. Um, so that's a really interesting approach. And certainly we were, I am happy to see that that was filed. And I think the drug manufacturers are very well positioned, right, to file that type of case. Now, the flip side of that is, you know, as a person with a uterus, I hate the idea that you know my uterus is in the hands of the drug manufacturers right the fate of my uterus but it's in the fate of the it's in the hands of the supreme court the fate of my uterus has not been in my hands since Dobbs was decided so um that's something that i think we're all grappling with and you know i think folks who knew that this was where we were headed have been grappling with that some for some time yeah so what's what happens next in this litigation? Just one question. Should I take it? You want to follow up? Good. Thanks. Sure. Go right ahead. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question. Um, you know, certainly we we are adapting the brief um, in as we speak <laughs> for the Fifth Circuit. It's going back to the Fifth Circuit, right? So for the full appeal. Um, and the reasoning of the panel decision, which left in place large parts of Judge Kaczmarek's stay, 
uh, is definitely we're responding to and trying to, even though the stay ruling is no longer in effect and is not binding on the next panel, um, you know, it certainly is a little bit of a tea leaves reading as to where a conservative panel of the Fifth Circuit might take might take this. Um, so we're trying to respond proactively to those to those reasons and argue that even a partial stay, even if we're turning back the clock to 2016, that would have tremendous harms and it would make medication abortion even harder to access than procedural abortion, in fact, because it would be layering on all of these med medically unjustified um, restrictions that were in place, you know, prior to 2016. So we're trying to retool it in terms of the, you know, centering voices of people harmed, definitely important to do that. And that's what we're trying to do in the end. But as amicus curiae, uh, you know, on the behalf of states, the blue states, the most powerful contribution we're making is here are the impacts on our residents. Here are how, here is how the, here's what the implications would be for the public policy uh, of states that want to protect abortion. And here's why the public interest weighs against the grant of an injunction in this case. And, you know, one of the things we tried to bring forward in the brief is that essentially what Judge Kaczmarek was doing was putting a thumb on the scales and crediting the arguments uh, about public interest of the red states that put in a brief, right? Mm -hmm. And argued about why they wanted to protect fetuses, but not even mentioning that they, their brief was cited three times. Our brief was not cited at all in the public interests section and analysis, right? So, you know, this is, this is thumb on the scales in a way that Dobbs expressly said the courts shouldn't be engaging in. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's part of what we're trying to bring forward as, as amici states. There are others who are really more bringing forward the patient harms um, lens. Uh, and there's actually a really interesting and great case that's been filed by the Center for Reproductive Rights in Texas. Um, Zorowski is the name of the lead plaintiff in that case, but it's basically telling the stories of five women who were denied emergency medical care because of Texas's ban on abortion procedures and the horrific circumstances that that left them in. And in, in many ways, it's a very narrow challenge. It's not a challenge to the entirety of that law. It's a challenge to argue that failing to allow for abortions, it, it's restricting ability to get abortions under emergency circumstances and to get emergency care for things like, um, you know, for things like miscarriage uh, or ectopic pregnancies. Uh, so that's a very powerful case that is really centering the voices of these women who were, whose families went through this harm and it was, you know, magnifying and, you know, adding layers of trauma to what is already a very traumatic event. Mm -hmm. Finding out a pregnancy was not viable, you know. No, oh, it's it. I was talking to a reporter the other day um, about these cases who said, oh, this looks like the beginning of the undoing of the FDA's authority or or federal scientific authority to regulate stuff like this. And I said, actually, it feels to me like we're kind of in the middle. <laughs> right? We're not at the beginning of that. Yeah. Um, the COVID cases, the OSHA cases, the environmental cases. Um, this is just the next one. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, you know, reading Kismarek's decision where he is second guessing as a judge, scientific decisions made by experts with anecdotal stories in those briefs, those very briefs you were just referencing, um, read to me just like the COVID cases mm -hmm. where you had public health officials deciding mass mandates, mass gathering bans. This is the thing what the science is telling us to do. And, oh no, you know, the judges are second guessing that medical judgment, that mm -hmm. scientific judgment. Mm -hmm. So it, in what way are you, is the work that you're doing contextualizing the reproductive health care within the context of science more generally and government expert scientific um, authority more generally? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think there are a number of answers to that uh, question. There's this sort of broader lens about undermining expert agency authority, which is a part of a move on behalf of the right to deregulate and attack the administrative state that's been ongoing for a long time. So there's that lens that you oh, can that bring lockerism. to it. Lockerism. Neo-Lockerism, Neo -lockerism, exactly. So you have that lens and that's, in, that's obviously in play here. 
Um, but I would say that with respect to abortion and regulation of abortion, it's always been in a class by itself when it comes to science and the relationship to science. Um, because there's, you know, what we call abortion exceptionalism in both that plays out in both the way abortion is regulated at the state level primarily, but also at the federal level, um, subjected to a higher level of regulation and that a higher level of governmental regulation is tolerated when it comes to the bodies of people with capacity to become pregnant uh, than in any other area. So, you know, a great example of that is the Stenberg versus Carhartt case, which is the ban on um, so-called partial birth abortion, where, you know, the court upheld the ban on against the prevailing medical evidence and testimony from many, many, all of the major medical associations saying this will put this is medically unjustified, will subject women to unnecessary and harmful medical procedures and you know, uh, cause all of these harms. And the court just like, basically ignored that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been true for, for many, many years. Uh, and that's always been true in how you know, trap laws play out, um, targeted regulation of abortion providers that, again, subject uh, abortion to a higher level of tolerated regulation. Mm -hmm. So those are the sort of two main angles on that. Like ignoring science, it's always been a thing in, <laughs> in abortion regulation. And it's also part of this broader effort to undermine agents of, agencies' authority. And definitely the FDA is now in the crosshairs of that, which you know essentially was building on a foundation that was laid in during the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic. Yeah. In that respect, I find this work so interesting and this issue at a really critical juncture because the anti-abortion jurisprudence and advocacy has always been a train you know, running in one direction, but it's now intersected with um, this deregulatory sort of Koch brothers, mm -hmm. um, longer term political agenda to shrink the state, the authority of the state. And so they're turning, and I think the Hobby Lobby case is similarly a, mm -hmm. an example of that, mm -hmm. of, um, of folks who didn't really care that much about abortion before um, turning to abortion opportunistically mm -hmm. as, um, as a way to advance this larger deregulatory agenda. Um, and uh, and th they've got a federal judiciary that's pretty, pretty um, happy to hear those cases, yes. unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. And so there's been some really interesting writing on this as a kind of neo lochnerism of uh, the return of a of a, of, of a of a kind of constitutional deference to a thin state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and abortion is certainly helping in that. Although, as you say, it's got its own momentum and mm -hmm. and other advocates. Okay, others questions? Yeah, Delphine. Thank you so much. Um, my essay was essentially about uh, judicial activism and forum shopping, and I think it was quite striking. Um, I mean, it was like a whole manoeuvre from the, um, from the conservatives. And coming from Belgium is quite striking for me to see how a judge here can be quite, uh, I mean, politicized, or in other words, having like really strong opinions. Um, because I feel like this raised serious questions of uh, impartiality and, I mean, I mean, regarding, I mean, seeing the comments of my uh, peers um, regarding my essay, I understand it's like, I mean, of course, it's, it's a thing in the US, but I was wondering uh, if we could have your views on this and whether you feel that this possibility of like judicial activism and like forum shopping generally has helped you or like not mm. throughout your work. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think that's, you know, everything you said is is right. Um, this isn't just forum shopping, it's judge shopping, right? Mm -hmm. They picked this judge, they incorporated in this part of Texas in order to be before this judge who was known to have these views about abortion specifically. And another case is coming up, also another bananas decision on standing um, that uh, was also by Judge Kismarek striking down the confidentiality provisions of the Title X Family Planning Grant Program. Uh, you know, again, on arguments that stretch standing beyond recognition of, of anything. And I'm reminded always of Jack Greenberg was my professor here um, 
you know, lion of the civil rights movement and, you know, had him for Civ Pro and his discussion of standing was really just a tool by the courts to like let in what they wanted and no, they didn't. Um, he was a good realist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and his war stories were wonderful. Um, but um, in this case, you have standing stretched so incredibly far. Um, and you also have, you know, very clearly opinion reads like it's right out of the pages of the National Right to Life Committee, including Unborn humans. Unborn humans, humans, talking about abortionists. Um, so, um, so it goes on and on. Yeah, and it happened to me in my world. Certainly, you know, as an impact organization, the ACLU gives thought to where it's going to file when it can. Um, and you know, so that's part of the pragmatic aspect of doing impact litigation on both sides of the aisle, so to speak. Um, has it actually helped? Probably. Um, you know, certainly I know that like some of the litigation that you're seeing filed in the Mifepristone Pristone uh, context, you know, think about where those cases have been filed in the forum, the forums that fora that they are being filed in, um, where there is a strategic reason to do so. So yeah, it's part of the dirty reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so going even further on that point, is there any way one could get rid of these judges? I mean, the, the, <laughs> no, but like, can you, can, can there not be an attempt, attempt to try and impeach them? Because the decision is just, it's, it's not a legal decision. It's just literally his opinion put on, put on paper. And to me, that there, there must be a way. I would hope there's a way to impeach them or is that something that's been tried to make sure that the judges who actually decide on these cases are either on the right side of things or at least neutral? I don't know. Um, you know, I think our system is built less after the fact. So the news today court and it's you know failure to various justices failure to disclose various transactions that would you know, very clear appearance of conflict of interest right and so um you know the and the confirmation process in advance was has changed a lot certainly in my career and i think you know from a focus on qualification away from qualifications and impartiality and it's turned into more just sort of political theory. Um, so you know I think that the accountability is not there and the legitimacy of the entire judicial system has really been called into question and I think the faith and you know it's yeah, we typically the way that we um, control against it, judges issuing bad, badly reasoned decisions is the appeals process, not removing the judge for, yeah. for being dumb, right, or <laughs> or just not doing a good job, right. Yeah, I think right. Well, I think that's, you know, where as a democracy, right, we count on the political process to eventually have that corrected, corrected right? And, you know, I think anybody who was watching the election in 2016, I mean, this is the day that we, the people who were upset about that, <laughs> you know, were, were looking toward happening. Everybody knew that this was the direction the Supreme Court was heading as soon as that election came out the way it did. Yeah. Um, kind of combining the questions um, that Nathaniel and Delphine brought, um, you mentioned standing, and I, I think it's quite shocking that like the lack of standing was not addressed by Samuel Alito at all when like when he wants standing to matter, it really, really does. Um, and 
I think like that combined with, um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh, that combined with his Dobbs opinion where he was saying like the states are out, like, like this is up, uh, this is all the state's decisions. Courts are out, like the complete lack of a, like actual thought about what is happening and that this is about abortion just months after saying like courts will not touch abortion anymore like how do you force like Samuel Alito to reckon with any type of thinking (laughs) so you know expecting intellectual consistency from the justices is what you're asking is that possible no but um you know as a litigant and as you know as a litigant and as a miki now um you know certainly we're the vote count matters and you know who your audience is and it is not a lead samuel alito you know that's not our audience so what is going to speak most powerfully to those justices who are now in the middle you know who who the thunk, right? Who the thunk, right? Uh, but you know what is going to appeal to him, and and I do also think that the, um, you know, when I first saw this case, um, you know, I get alerts. I saw this case, and I thought, this is so like this is so outlandish. This can't go anywhere, right? This is like this is going to get thrown out in a heartbeat. And that was before I really knew anything about Judge Kuzmarek. Um, so, you know, the fact that it is so outlandish that it really doesn't pass the laugh test that you have, you know, a theory of standing that would allow an abortion provider to come in and say, I am emotionally harmed when my Texas patient can't, you know, it hurts me. Like that theory of standing has, a, obviously it's a double edged sword, right? And so uh, I do part of me that still believes in the legitimacy of the process hopes that you know this is an overreach and that it will be it is so outrageous and so far fetched um that it won't be accepted so i still harbor hope i really do and you know that is me being very pollyanna the reproductive rights groups came to the attorney general's office and said this case is one to watch we're really worried about it and they were right obviously because here we are today Having big pharma on your side, yes, is kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy when I saw I that. I mean, brief. there's an interest convergence here yeah. that is kind of nice, right? Yeah, strange bedfellows, right? Yeah, but I'll take it. It was a great brief. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, hi, just going back to the science question and also um, how you sort of prepared your brief for um, when it was still, um, you know, the trial court level I would like to say yeah Um, you know why did you choose like the arguments that you did like knowing that you know Judge Kaczmarek is not prone to you know any sort of like uh, healthy scientific thinking at all like is there some sort of you know an alternative argument that you could use because the brief was amazing um, and uh, very well footnoted uh, when compared to like you know the hostile states brief And um, yeah, I was just wondering if there's just anything else that like any sort of other strategy that you could uh, use or some other argument that you could um, when you're, you know, approaching a bench like as Merrick. Yeah, I think he probably was not our audience ultimately, and we knew that. So um, that certainly played into like decisions about what to include in the brief and not. And I'll also say that, you know, this brief was filed on behalf of, I think it was like 23 in the district court level, up to 24 uh, by the time we got to the Supreme Court, 21 at the district court level. Anyway, it grew as we went up Um, and the the brief changed as we went up too. Um, So, you know, part of it is an art of, um, an art of collaboration and making sure that we're able to build consensus. Um, So some arguments came out or were de-emphasized and other ones were given more prominence uh, as a part of that sort of sausage making process. And we were very happy to have the large coalition that we got. Um, And we're hoping to keep it um, when we go back to the Fifth Circuit. Um, So all of that is considerations that went into it. I think that ultimately, you know, we always knew the audience was going to be the Supreme Court. Um, And, you know, we didn't say anything too radical, crazy. And the emphasis was more on the harm to states 
and even our pocketbooks, right? The, the harm to states uh, because we felt that that was more persuasive than necessarily arguments about devastating harms to people who can become pregnant mm -hmm. for this court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Roy. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, one uh, sort of argument that the uh, uh, the plaintiffs brought that caught my eye um, was that the FDA approval of Mifepristone, um, the regulations that approved it, uh, say that the drug is used to treat illnesses. And they actually say that pregnancy is not an illness. And obviously, like, the sort of content of that statement, I agree with, but the way that they weaponized it, I did not. Um, but I'm curious what you made of that argument and how it is perhaps in tension with broader questions about like the over pathologization of pregnancy, um, how that might be in tension actually with um, other kind of gender-based uh, issues um, like you could just as easily say, you know, um, trans people uh, need medical care, but they do not have illnesses. Um, did you think that their argument was kind of just textualist BS, or did you think that there is kind of something to that? Um, you know, that question has come up a lot in different contexts, and so my first association was from litigating in employment discrimination cases under Title VII um, and the ADA. And under the ADA, pregnancy is not considered a disability or a disabling condition um, because it doesn't interfere with a major life activity, I guess. Huh. Um, so, you know, that has been law for a very long time. And I've confronted arguments about trying to basically normalize or minimize the impacts of pregnancy on people's bodies for a long time. So I think that's part of that impulse on part of the right to um, treat pregnancy as the blessing that every woman, you know, should be, you know, working toward her entire life, right? And it's a blessing even when it is the result of unwanted sex or, um, you know, violent sex or uh, uh, other things. So, you know, it, it's, and you could see that in Amy Coney Barrett's responses during the arguments in Dobbs about how, you know, there is no more pregnancy discrimination because, you know, we've passed all of these laws protecting the Pregnancy Discrimination Act has been passed and you can just drop off your baby at a fire station um, if you don't want to continue raising it. And just, you know, really minimizing the very, very real impacts on bodies that bear children, um, you know, which is part of a very long history in our country of exploiting the bodies of people who bear children, in particular, you know, people of color. So, you know, I wasn't surprised by any of it. It's all part of that very consistent view and in codified in the law in these really unfortunate ways. The law does put you in that uncomfortable position of the statutes cover particular human events, mm -hmm. illnesses, mm -hmm. or in the case of trans folks who want medical treatment uh, and care, uh, gender affirming care, they they have to fall within a DSM category mm -hmm. to qualify. And Spade's written very thoughtfully on this issue about the double bind of the medication. But it's a it's an impossible place that you're, you're put in in many ways because of the way the laws are written. Right, it's very narrow, and you're in these boxes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the reality is very much in tension with what the law necessarily can do. <laughs> yeah. Hi. In terms of both this case, but also your strategy overall. Could you speak at all to balancing, like working within this framework that we've been left with post Dobbs, but also trying to fight against Dobbs? Like mm -hmm. if that's something that, you know, we're able to do still. I think there might be efforts to narrow Dobbs. I think that, you know, that's something that we shouldn't give up. Um, obviously it was a split decision and so, there's some sense that there might be some room around the margins there. 
Um, but I think, you know, Dobbs is law. So we are stuck, we are stuck within the bounds of that, whatever, wherever those bounds are, right? Um, legally. For I now. think in terms of advocacy, yeah. yeah, for now, in terms of advocacy, anything is open still and we should be fighting like hell. So yeah, don't give up. <laughs> have some radical ideas, not to say that you or the, the AG embrace these strategies right now, but what are some really creative more radical ideas that you've heard from the advocates team or mm -hmm. uh, the folks who are, mm -hmm. who are willing to take some more risks. Mm -hmm. There's a really interesting theory trying to revive or apply the 13th Amendment um, and Reconstruction Amendments to to you know involuntary servitude being taken over by a fetus and being forced by the states to bear a pregnancy. So that is definitely one that is being debated and discussed a good deal. I think there is, you know, this is my personal view, you know, it's not likely that the Supreme Court would be any more welcoming to that type of theory, um, but perhaps it's something that right now, but that is perhaps something that we could be laying the groundwork for in, you know, careful ways. Um, it's also something we have to do carefully uh, as always when, you know, kind of analogizing out from conditions of slavery and servitude, involuntary servitude. But making that argument in the name of women of color, black right. women in particular, yeah. would be a, probably the best place to start. Yeah. That's the place you have to start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Taylor? Thank you so much for speaking with us. I'm sure Professor Frankie knew what a timely um, visit this would be with everything going on in the last few weeks. So I have a question. We've spoken a lot about this class, about the way these cases, um, these foundational cases are argued and how, you know, perhaps if Roe had been decided on a different different logistical um, argument or just depending on how they're framed has greater consequences. And, you know, I already have a friend who needed um, misoprostol last week and due to just shortages from fear, couldn't access it. So, you know, there's obviously consequences in the way that we're framing these things. So if this gets back up to the Supreme Court, whenever it may be, um, I guess I would like to know how you think, what argument you think that they would do, and then also what would the least harmful way of them, I guess, denying our access to Mifepristone or approving our continued access that would have the best effects and the least harmful effects um, continuing forward. So, you know, we talked a little bit about this neo um, and how we have a Supreme Court who is just ready to shut down the administrative state at a moment's notice, but we also have a pretty federalist friendly, you know, Supreme Court. So perhaps that cross state power, you know, issue isn't going to be something that they'll address at this moment in time. So if it comes back up to the Supreme Court, I guess, what arguments are you anticipating and what would the least harmful way of them denying this? Um, if you could, I guess, what, what is the team, you know, ready to, to fight for? Well, so the team is the federal government, right? So the federal government is charged with defending, you know, the FDA's determinations here. Um, and I don't know a lot about their thinking, um, just what I can glean, you know, from the briefs. I do know there's been a concerted amicus effort, which is more driven by, you know, the advocacy impact organizations in the reproductive justice space, trying to make sure that there are voices before the court that are again going to be, um, they're going to be received openly, more openly. So I think, you know, the pharmaceutical executives brief is a great example of that, you know, the impact on business um, of, you know, their argument is essentially that, you know, they, this entire industry is built around relying on the, you know, integrity of the FDA's scientific process and expert evaluations. And that's the gold standard. And that suddenly letting you know, randos basically <laughs> come in and upend that uh, and, you know, have a court second guess it on the basis of, you know, physicians saying, I don't like this medication and what it does to patients, not even my patients, other people's patients, um, that that is, you know, a bridge too far and, and that that is, you know, shaking the foundation of that entire industry in a way that would have broader implications for a host of different medications and products. Um, so I think that's a very powerful argument that is more likely to be, you know, received with open arms before the court. You know, and again, in terms of how the um, federal government is framing this, they've sort of thrown everything at it at this point. Up, up until this point, I don't see them pulling punches necessarily on arguments 
Um, so they're bringing every argument out that I, you know, I don't see any big omissions um, in how they're how they're defending this. Um, in terms of what's the least dangerous way we could lose, um, is that your question? Like, what is the least threatening way we could lose? I, I think the least threatening way we could lose because we've you know looked at. If we talked about a little bit if Roe was argued not under the right of privacy, then perhaps we would either still have it today or it would have greater expansions. We looked at the right to marriage as well. So I guess the right to an abortion and the right to medicine and the right to potentially even birth control, if it's go back to the Supreme Court, then yes, like the least harmful way. Like, is it, is it, I don't, in my opinion, I think that like that, again, that neo Lochnerism is a slippery slope and that might be the most harmful. And I was wondering, what would you hope, I guess, the legal argument of the Supreme Court would be to minimize the effects? If it's that business one that you said, you can just- Yeah, I mean, I think I think that there, I don't have necessarily ways that I would do it differently than what the, what the federal government has done so far. They might be a little bolder, um, but I don't know that that is necessarily, again, going to be particularly persuasive to this court. So they're being cautious and that's, probably the best approach. Um, and in terms of outcomes, you know, there's a real range of outcomes that could happen here. Um, the Fifth Circuit actually did what I thought was the most, most moderate conservative approach, which is basically saying anything after 2016, everything before 2016 is time barred and anything after that is, is fair game to be reviewed, um, even though the results are devastating, right? Um, but it has, you know, it's hinging on more procedural questions. Um, and, and I think that gives the court an out. So, I mean, I'm answering your question, the opposite of your question. I'm hoping that they rule narrowly on the standing thresholds, judis justiciability questions, um, and that they, you know, toss the case out on those grounds because they see it as, they see the implications of expansion. So radical, such a radical expansion of doctrines of standing and and exhaustion of administrative rem remedies. Yeah. Sure. Um, you mentioned some of the various legal doctrine and areas that you've sort of encountered in the fight for reproductive rights. And I was just wondering if you had anything to say about sort of like pivoting and learning like a completely foreign area of the law. Like, so right now, like, right, extra, extraterritoriality is like the hot, like how have you sort of um, like, H has it been difficult? If I wonder if you have anything to say about just like, this is the new area where the fight is. And so now we have to become experts in that area. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. I mean, that is exactly where we're at. Um, like suddenly I'm an expert in FDA law. Um, so that definitely was not something I anticipated. And mm -hmm. same thing with, you know, basic constitutional uh, principles around, you know, federalism and, um, you know, the balance between states competing authority um, is something that I am learning quickly as I go. And I think all of the repro experts are. One of the things that's been, and also penal law, oh my gosh, learning about the penal law. I am not a criminal lawyer. I didn't even take crim pro, even though I clerked for Judge Lynch who, you know, mm. um, I don't know the slightest thing about, <laughs> you know, the penal law. And so suddenly being in a world in which healthcare is literally criminal. Um, you know, this has been a challenge to, I think, all the repro health advocates who have, for the most part, been strictly on the civil side. There's an, ex there's an exception of that to that, which is a group called Pregnancy Justice. They used to be called National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Now they have a much more inclusive name. Dana Thank you. Oh, Dana was here. All right. So you learned from Dana about <laughs> Dana and her group have basically, and Lynn Paltrow, who founded it, basically like laid the groundwork for our understanding now of what the world we're now living in because they've been doing this work on criminalization of pregnancy for years you know basically since i've been in this space working in this space my entire legal career and before so you know they're the exception in that they've really had to grapple with criminalization for a really long time and made that the focus of their work um but i think the rest of us are just all scrambling to catch up the nice part is that there are a lot of criminal lawyers who have stepped up to help um, and are involved in trying to marshal support among criminal defenders in advance of any criminal prosecutions. And so far, you know, there have not been a flood yet of criminal prosecutions, um, but I think that people are very attentive to trying to, to stand up the resources 
for when that day arrives. Yeah. Um, so earlier in our conversation, Professor Frankie was asking about whether we should be legitimizing tactics or arguments um, that especially conservatives have been, that conservatives advocate. And you also mentioned a little later about you know, knowing and writing for your audience. And in that vein, as again, you, you've both been discussing, we've, well, not me, I think a lot of people have been like kind of happy about, you know, you know, in a way about the fact that there is corporate backing behind this. But I personally am very hesitant about that. Um, you know, using the argument that this harms corporate interests might secure our abortion rights. I think it would do so maybe in a very limited way, but I'm also honestly very fearful of the consequences that would have for other areas, especially healthcare more generally. And I wonder what your thoughts are specifically on the use of that argument, um, knowing that, you know, it, ultimately really privileges the interests of corporations over the interests of humans and what that might mean for all the issues that we're facing in yeah. the US right now. No, I think those are really the right questions to be asking. And yes, obviously it's a pragmatic decision. Pragmatic decisions are being made based on like what can, how can we best ensure the least harmful outcome in this case. Um, longer term, yeah, absolutely right. And there are limits to that, right? Because that require that requires the companies to step up, right? Corporate uh, corporate America has to step up and actually be willing to defend um, some of these decisions. And they may not, they may be well, less willing to do so um, in circumstances where they perceive less broad support, right? We've had a very wide showing of support since Dobbs of what we knew already that a you know, majority of Americans are pro-choice and believe women should be able to control their own fertility, as should everybody else. But, you know, there, there are other circumstances in which these cases will come up that might be dealing with places where the public is more divided. And I think that the, you know, rights of transgender folk is a very, very good example of how the right is using that as a splinter um, issue and, and trying to do, trying to make hay from that. Um, and that's one where also there's, you know, medical, there's a medical aspect of it and there's, you know, pharmaceutical companies are involved and who knows whether they would step up in the same way. Um, and I do think that gender affirming care is next in the line of fire in terms of FDA, you know, FDA's authority. Yeah, and PrEP, things like that. Yeah, and PrEP. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of, uh, some of, the, many of these um, pharmaceutical companies are, based in the South or based in states that have li uh, limited access to a wide range of reproductive health care. Are you aware of any of them that have stepped up in this um, Mifepristone case, creating opportunities for the employees or others to push them to be better on access to reproductive health care as, as employers? Yeah, you know, I'm being a kind of yeah. Moment that right. I'm not aware of pharma companies in specific, but I do know there's been a real effort to push corporate America and the business yeah. community to do that, to stand up. Um, I just don't know if there's been a concerted effort. So that would be on, on pharmaceutical companies in particular. That's a good, a good thing to suggest. Um, but I know there's been, you know, it's been playing out at the, you know, in proxy um, battles and, and, and other areas where shareholders are trying to get these on, proxy ballots and there's, I am surprised there hasn't been more discussion of, you know, essentially boycotts of states that have abortion bans in place. Yeah. Archie, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah. Hi, thank you for this <clears throat> conversation. So my question is a bit theoretical, but uh, uh, I was wondering that like, as we have like all been discussing that with these kind of bizarre decisions, the faith on the judiciary and law as a whole has probably gone down. Now, in a strange way, do you think that it affirms and strengthens 
the challenge that feminist legal theory has made to the law as a whole that law has always been historically the tool for dominant of dominance and subjugation and here it has just taken a very naked form mm. and in that way does it raise new calls for decentering the law mm. and thinking beyond the law and emphasizing on the importance of social movements and political organization and all of that and probably sh- and should that be informing us lawyers going forward yeah that's a great question absolutely and i think you know the law will not save us <laughs> we know that um i say this as an impact lawyer so you know in training um but you know fully understanding the limitations and um i've I come from, you know, social justice activism and advocacy and always see those as twin strategies where, you know, you need to be building the base of popular movement and support. And without that, the law is even more constrained. So I don't know if that's exactly, it's an excellent question. And I think, yes, and I'm not quite ready to give up on the legal system and you know, I'm also, you know, in the streets holding signs and we all should be. Yeah. Going back, thanks for being here, by the way. Um, going back to the sort of stakeholders issue that we were talking about, where your um, strange bedfellows, as you say, with corporate America, with uh, pharmaceutical companies, you'll also in your own experience, but also more generally be very closely connected to the ACLU and other advocacy groups. Do you and the AG's office feel sort of in the middle of those stakeholders? Do you feel like you're balancing the interests of, of a wide range of groups and interests? And if so, how do you how do you manage that sort of balancing of interests? Mm-hmm. So far, you know, the things I've worked on has had this strange alignment. So I haven't really had an occasion yet to be, you know, navigating um, among those. Um, Certainly not in, you know, in terms of corporate America. I think there was a question as to where the pharma companies were going to come out. And there was a profound relief that they were, they came out where they did. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think it wasn't clear up until sort of the end how many would be joining that uh, effort. Um, so that was a tremendous round of work went on behind the scenes to get that to happen, um, organizing work. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I haven't yet encountered that. I can tell you that, you know, certainly while at ACLU, there were many occasions where we had to navigate those types of tensions. Um, amongst different advocacy organizations, you know, trying to mobilize or get corporate America to step up. Um, That was much more frequent occurrence actually when I was there. Um, And so far, I think the attorney general has generally been very aligned with the advocacy organizations on repro issues. I, you know, have not yet, any differences of opinion are mainly on the margins about strategy and nothing major so I've, I've been lucky that far mm-hmm. hi thank you so much for being here um i know you touched on this briefly at the beginning of the talk but i was really interested um to hear that you know in your new role in a government role where you have sort of broad enforcement and investigatory authority um that you are actually sort of investigating these repeat violators of new york um, reproductive laws I think I'm just really interested in this um, kind of like false sense of complacency that I think a lot of people who live in blue states might have about how safe their reproductive rights are. And actually, as um, as you alluded to, like there are people who are spreading misinformation and trying to chip away at the foundation. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to um, those dangers that we face, even in places like New York and the strategies to combat them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that I don't really like calling New York or other states like it access states because there are still such profound barriers to access mm-hmm. for many uh, underserved populations, women of color, trans folks. You know, it's it's um, not an, 
accurate depiction of reality to call it an access state. So I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to remove those barriers. Um, and that's where I personally am trying to focus the enforcement efforts of our office. So trying to look at you know, incarcerated people or people in the foster care system um, as sort of in institutional settings where both any changes can have the greatest impact and we're really uh, able to hopefully move the needle for for folks who are at the margins. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I think that there's, you know, a, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in those areas. And I think, you know, as many people pointed out when Dobbs came down that women of color have been living in a post Dobbs world essentially for the entire time. And that reproductive justice is a relatively new lens that's being brought to this movement to try and center the voices of the folks who have been most marginalized. And, and that has not been true for the majority of time that you know, reproductive rights has been on the agenda. Alyssa? Yeah, I just, I think that's such an important point that Ariana brought up. And I just wanna add color to it by saying that it's not even just like efforts against marginalized groups, but it's literally religious fanatics at the Planned Parenthood blocking access to the clinics in New York every single Saturday, put, like posing as fake escorts, putting out information about CPCs, and also getting an official escort from the NYPD week after week as a parade. So I think it is like really important to just make sure we have the full picture of what reproductive access in New York looks like. And honestly, I would love to hear your perspective Obviously it's a different arm of law enforcement, but as someone in the law enforcement space, like what you think the role of NYPD is here and how that may or may not conflict with what Mayor Adams says, uh, his views about reproductive access in New York are. Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak to NYPD specifically, but you know, in general law enforcement, I know across the state, there's a very uneven response to clinic access issues and clinic defense. Um, and that's something we're looking at. How does the AG's office best fit in terms of beefing up enforcement of freedom of access to clinic entrances laws, both at the state, federal and the state level, and better coordinating law enforcement response on the ground? Um, you know, we are not like our office doesn't actually have any authority over law enforcement agents at that level. It's at the county level and um, across the state. So, you know. And sometimes if we, so we can put out, for example, opinions about or guidance on what we think the law does and what its bounds are, but it's not binding, you know, on any particular police officer uh, in terms of enforcement. And sometimes it's just like poking the bear. So you don't want to necessarily uh, trigger backlash. So we're trying to think about what is the most constructive way that we can kind of use our both bully pulpit and, you know, sort of overarching um, powers as the top law enforcement agent in the state um, in an area where I think the attorney general's office has been particularly effective actually at you know securing access. So like we have brought a lot of very successful litigation under face and you know gotten a lot of kind of bad actors at least temporarily taken out of commission there or gotten good injunctions. Um, and so you know we're gonna be beefing that up for sure. Um, trying to do more and better, work better, uh, and build better collaboration between the various pieces of the puzzle. So like at the county level and the state level. Alyssa, did you mention to Galen that your work is cited in their brief? You want to mention it now? Oh, tell me. <laughs> sure. Um, VA for this. Yeah. <laughs> um, the brief actually cites to the work of New York student advocates who are trying to get medication abortion passed on college campuses, which we just did. So a bit of good repro news is now all SUNY and CUNY campuses will be providing medication abortion. Um, but yeah, so that work is actually cited too on in the amicus brief. Yeah, great. That's awesome. I'm so glad you were part of that. Thank you for doing that. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to, you mentioned um, in several of your responses of speaking to the right audience when you're issuing like briefs or writing briefs and, and things like that, like how you decide that for 
work on the national level, but also for work on the state level. Like who, when you, I feel like the vacillating opinions of like the jurisprudence in around the country, just even within states, but also with nationally, like how do you know? Well, how do we know who, who the audience is? Yeah, like who you want to address. The yeah. Of the court. Yeah, that's it. It's an inexact science, and there are definitely people who are more steeped in it than I am. I'm not that, you know, much watching wonk. So I tend to turn to my friends who are and just ask them like more about what this bench is like. And, you know, at the ACLU, we were lucky in that we had local affiliates around the country who practice before these courts all the time. So they really knew at the district court level and at the appellate level what mostly in federal court, what their benches look like, and and to some degree also in state court. So in New York, I'm just learning this, I you know, because I have really not litigated here much. Um, even when I was at the NYCLU, the laws at the time were, it, we did some FACE Act stuff, but we didn't really do litigation. It was more policy work when I was there because the laws are already, we're not in court challenging them. And now from the attorney general side in state court, we're actually, I mentioned defending laws against challenges. We have a number of different cases that we're defending that are pertinent to reproductive rights. Some of them are religious liberty based challenges to things like the contraceptive or uh, abortion care coverage mandates that have been put into effect over time. Um, there's a challenge to the new crisis pregnancy center uh, study bill, like the you know religious liberty of the sisters of the poor. They don't want to even be studied. <laughs> like they don't even want to be subjected to you know, a document request from the State Department of Health. Um, so those types of things. And and that will be playing out at the state court level. It's a long way of saying I will be learning it as I go because I don't really know the composition that well. And so I ask people who do. <laughs> and it's pretty much word of mouth. It's not like you can look it up anywhere, right? You can look up who appointed them. And that was what I did, for example, when I was arguing the Skirts case, the Peltier case. Um, you know, I don't practice. That was my first argument before the Fourth Circuit. So I asked my colleagues at the ACLU who practice there regularly for their take. I asked Josh Block of the ACLU, who is like my biggest court watching wonk. He would he would probably claim that uh, title. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I asked people who have that depth of knowledge, and and then you tool it accordingly. Like you you frame your arguments carefully, and how to tell a story in the brief, and how to kind of evoke what you want to the audience you want as a art form that you know evolves over time and that I think most lawyers are constantly improving on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's an excellent question. And I think that there, you know, those countries are sort of in a parallel position to the, you know, uh, pro choice states, blue states, right? Um, where they're suddenly confronting this wave of new legal questions that we never thought we would have to confront. Um, in terms of whether the conversations are happening, yeah, you're right, they're mostly happening at the federal level, and I we haven't really been talking about them yet within our office, um, but I think we'd be interested too, so. We have state court as Canada. Yes, we do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think that the provider protections law related to extradition, I don't know I don't know enough about how that functions internationally. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. 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 Cameron, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, I was just going to go back to the um, audience question, and I was wondering what your perspective on like the media would be from the state side. Um, do you ever find that to be a useful tool, or is that something media attention ever something that you would want to cultivate in a particular scenario, or just how would you go about thinking about that? Yeah, um, I'm still learning that um, in the new position, and certainly it's different um, than it was at the ACLU and my clue. Um, at the at the ACLU, you know, media was a big part of our strategy. Public 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 education were a part, and we talked about it as sort of like the third leg of the stool. Like, if you're just doing the work and no one finds out about it, and you're not moving the needle in terms of public opinion, then you're really not accomplishing what you need to. In part, because of the movement building arguments, right? Um, the importance of, of movement building. And that's been something that I think the LGBT project has been particularly uh, successful at in many ways, although there's been maybe some regression on the issues relating to gender affirming care and transgender athletes um, lately in terms of public opinion. But it was a much bigger part of what my work was when I was there than it is now. Um, and there's more of a kind of firewall um, in terms of the way our office handles media. So there's a communications team and, you know, the lawyers get to review their press releases for accuracy kind of thing, but we're not really in a big part of the strategy there. And I think, you know, the reality is that she is a political candidate, right? And so, you know, there's that aspect of what she's doing too. Like she, she is, going for re-election or election to higher office eventually as all of the politicians are. And so that's coming to it from a different place where there's a, another layer um, of like, what is the purpose of media attention for a government, an elected official? It's, it has that overlay too. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not really part of that personally. Um, and, you know, uh, I think they're also pretty careful about what, in, in particular when there's litigation happening, um, a cautious approach is, definitely um, sort of the better part of valor there. Yeah. So I see Jordan, Natasha, Juliana, you had your hand up. I wanna make sure I'm not missing anybody. Take it away, Jordan. Okay, um, thanks for coming. Um, I'm curious, like you were observing sort of like the court crisis um, very closely on the day-to-day -day and the sense of, um, sort of this turn away, at least in my view, from like objective reality. And I'm talking about like the scientific community and like consensus on like the importance of access to reproductive care for like uh, gender affirming care and really like even like the environment crisis and COVID, like things like this, where the scientific community is basically close to consensus on what is reality. Um, and then some of these judges who are, um, in my view, sometimes appointed not through the most democratic of means or kind of going against what um, is true. Um, and so to that point, I'm curious what your view is on court reform. Um, if you have a stance on like expanding the Supreme Court, like filibuster abolition or just other like more like democratic approaches to getting these judges who like are not in step with like both popular opinion project or it's like saving the country um I guess it's like so I guess that's my that's my question yeah um I mean I certainly cannot answer that on behalf of the attorney general's office um and I should say everything I've been saying is not on behalf of the attorney general's office um it's my personal uh take um but um I mean I have personal views about that you want those? I mean, I, I think all should be uh, all should be on the table. Everything should be on the table in terms of court reform. Unfolding in the past few weeks about disclosures about the Supreme Court and how obviously it is not policing itself. The judiciary is notoriously bad at policing itself. And that's been true. You've seen that play out in, for example, like the scandals around harassment of law clerks and uh, and so on. Um, so, and even just 
luck like hiring and things like that you know so they're not they're not very accountable and they're the least accountable in terms of they're farther removed from you know like the questions before about impeachment of judges um, it's very very extraordinarily hard to do that and so we're counting on the democratic process and the democratic process as you said has gotten to be less it's not particularly democratic how judges are appointed particularly in the federal level the state level there are i mean you saw you know recent um well judicial elections that are going to actually change potential outcomes of cases right so um so there's there are at the state court at least in some states it's a little bit more of a direct relationship and that raises its own set of problems around you know electoral reform and money and money in politics and all of that do you have a personal position or view on expanding the number of members of the court or term limits or you know i'm i think term limits would be a very wise move i am less decided on court expansion because i feel like it could be a tool that is used by both sides you know in the same way that the filibuster you know a uh, double-edged sword and so you have to think very carefully before you make those changes that could come back to bite you Seems like the Republicans are the only ones that use the filibuster. The Democrats, yeah, right. the they don't have the yeah, yeah. Um, Natasha, thank you again for coming. Um, okay, so I have a prompt before my question. Okay, so also from a district court in Texas, another injunction was issued in the environmental justice aspect, which also affects the same communities as reproductive justice, where an injunction stopped an EPA ruling expanding the definition of waters of the United States to include upstreams, which a lot of businesses obviously fall out of. Um, and interesting enough, in the EPA context, um, a lot of the businesses were opposing this expansion of the definition, which is a huge burden and was a big conflict. But in this context, pharmaceutical companies came to your aid and they kind of like assisted you. But the point is, is that these two federal agencies are both halted and issued injunctions from Texas saying that you have overstepped your authority in an area that has been presumed to be in the states. States control the waters. States should control abortion rights. Do you think that this signals um, that at least in the reproductive justice aspect that the fight should switch from the federal level to the state level or that you should continue to push for federal level reproductive justice even though there seems there seems to be like an ushering of the federal government taking a step back or being challenged i mean i think from an advocacy standpoint from a movement standpoint it's both and and uh, you know i think there should be a push to the federal at the federal level for bolder action um at the same time, I think individuals and the movements, um, I think in the reproductive justice movement and more broadly, there's been less of a recognition of state and local governments are uh, in, in regulating, probably less so in the environmental context. Um, definitely in the repro context, there has been, I think just advocacy, like many people don't know, who knows who their uh, state senator is? Who knows? It's okay if you don't, because very few people do. But very few people do, right? And yet these are the people that are making the laws now that are going to affect you the most. And that's actually been true for a really long time. Like it's not, <laughs> it's not news. It's just that they have the balance of power has shifted, right? Between the federal and the state level on abortion because Roe was always the backstop. That was the floor beneath which you could not go. And that's no longer true. So now, you know, deep underground is the limit and, you know, the states are where that's gonna play out. So I think there has to be renewed attention to the state level. You know, there was, you recently saw it play out in terms of um, Kathy Hochul's, um, you know, appointment to the Supreme Court or to the uh, Court of Appeal, you know, uh, in a new way, I think state courts and state legislatures are getting new attention, and that's right, and they should. And as advocates, we should be focusing our attention in a laser-like way, particularly in red and purple states on those state um, bodies. Yeah. Going back a little bit to our previous conversation about um, connections with other areas of law enforcement, um, I'm wondering if 
if there's been any consideration of providing guidance or um, looking at the ways in which um, reproductive justice beyond just access to abortion is implicated in the connections between medical providers and law enforcement insofar as like testing after birth. This, we, we've heard a lot uh, in connection with uh, reproductive justice issues that come up in maternal settings as a part of what then become family uh, family court cases, um, sort of this also sprawling network within New York State that compromises people's um, access to abortion and, and medical and related prenatal uh, care. Yeah, um, it's definitely an area of interest for myself in terms of um, potential I mentioned the clinic access, you know, component of it and how we can better communicate with law enforcement at the local level and also with clinics so that we're hearing of problems when they're arising. Um, so that's a focus. And then also on the maternal um, drug testing issue, you know, we're looking into that too. Um, and thinking about guidance more broadly, like how can we be useful? We, we've done sort of dear colleague letters as a sort of like a sub-regulatory guidance thing. We don't have regulatory authority, like we don't issue regulations, right? Um, but, you know, there are certain entities that we do have some oversight over and we can um, let them know what our view of the law is. So that's, you know, certainly one area. Um, and, and then if there's actual violations of law, we can do a targeted investigation of, like, if we learn that a particular hospital has practices that are um, negatively impacting um, pregnant people and resulting in referrals to law enforcement or family regulation, uh, you know, interference in their lives, um, we can look into that. And that's definitely what I'm interested in looking into. Well, oh, ladies, please. Um, really quickly, thank you so much for being here. Uh, you've had an incredible career and you've done a lot of really fantastic advocacy work. I was wondering if you had like a favorite case or like a highlight case for you and potentially like what were the enabling conditions that allowed that to go so well or to become successful? Part two would be, are there any lessons there that we can apply like mm -hmm. in strategy moving forward, how to, you know, get people to be moving in the direction we want them to be and uh, yeah, where, where we can do that within the law and yeah, where you see strategy. So it's sort of like asking me to pick, pick a favorite among my children. I can't. Um, there are some cases where I feel really positive results, um, and I feel really proud of the results. I actually think that one of my, like, one of my most having been part of the reform of New York's abortion law, um, in order to get in place the protection, codify the protections of Roe. And that was an effort that I started when I was at the NYCLU. And that was, it took until 2019 for that law to take effect, to, to be enacted. What it took was a change in the composition of the New York State Legislature, just so we're coming right back to focusing on knowing who your state representatives are and, and voting. Um, and, and that we were able to put in place. And that's why we're in the place we're in right now in New York. So I'm very proud to have been a part of that effort. Um, but in terms of like cases and clients, I mean, the skirts case is awfully fun. And I love that case. And my clients were like these amazing, badass kids. Um, so, you know, super articulate and great at standing up for themselves and talking about what the impact was on them. Uh, I don't know if you read any of the affidavits in that case, but they had very powerful affidavits about what it meant to them to be, um, forced to wear skirts every day. Um, so they were great. And then I had another case about uh, representing airline pilots and flight attendants who wanted to be able to pump breast milk when they returned to work after giving birth and they were basically forced onto unpaid leave if they wanted to do that or they were forced to give up breastfeeding. So that was another case that um, was, you know, pushing the envelope legally and one that, um, you know, I adored all my clients and still do. And so I'm very glad I got to work with them. The flight attendants case has settled uh, and the pilots case is still ongoing. Um, yeah. And tell PA what's going to happen there. Oh, God, save us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's very worrisome that the Supreme Court has asked for um, an opinion from the uh, Attorney General as to where things stand. Um, so Solicitor General. So that's really worrisome that they may 
be looking very closely at whether charter schools are even subject to the constitution. So I'm worried. Right, that would, apart from the dress. Apart dress from the code. actual dress code. I mean, and the actual substance of the case, you couldn't have better facts, um, good, bad facts, right? I, they're terrible facts, which means it's great <laughs> to bring it. They're very, very compelling facts. Um, you know, but there's also the the bent of the court is very conservative, um, obviously. And, you know, like Amy Coney Barrett never wears pants. So <laughs> you know what I mean. Keeping an eye on her. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, advice that you have for a bunch of these folks are graduating in about a week or mm -hmm. so, 10 days. Um, it's a little jumping up and down in seats. Yeah. <laughs> Um, advice for them of you've had an you're still having an incredible career um, as a real defender of a broad set of key issues in the gender justice space. Mm. What 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 are some lessons you've learned that maybe you could pass on? Yeah, sorry, that was your second part of your question too. Um, lessons learned that I could pass on. You know, follow your passion. My dad said to me, "What are you going to do with your women's studies major?" So I think I've answered, yeah, answered him that. Um, yeah, so, you know, that's, it's all going to sound very trite, but follow your passion. And also any initial career move you make at, right at first is not going to make or break your career. Like there are really not wrong decisions here that you can make You can make different decisions and they take you along different paths and the paths can re-intersect. So um, you know, if you if you want to, if you have a passion for public interest, but you actually need to pay off your loans, it's okay to go to a firm and do that. And then you can find ways to remain engaged with public interest work. Um, you know, and and the bar association is a great way to do that. You know, um, I was a member of City Bar and active on a bunch of different City Bar committees, and that was super fun and a good way to stay involved. Um, so find ways to just do what you love. Like I, I worked on women's rights for women's rights for most of my career, but I also really care a lot about LGBT rights. And so like the Bar Association was the way I did that work. I was on the LGBT committee of the New York City Bar Association. So I was like extracurricularly doing like LGBT rights work. And, you know, my day job was reproductive rights work. And it's all intertwined, right? So it's all connected. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's it. Um, and yeah, just good luck, have fun, do something fun if you can right after you graduate, take a breather. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay. <laughs> um, opportunities to work in your office? Many, are many, yes. yes. So there's like a very robust summer intern program, um, you know, paid, paid summer intern program. So I'm not sure where they're at in the hiring process. They probably have already hired for this summer, but for those who are not graduating, not applying. I have a legal aid position, which is, you know, the sole person that I actually supervise in my current job um, is, is a current student. So, and it's a ton of really interesting work because like if she doesn't do it, no one does. So it's, it really is a, a great position. So that I'll be hiring for the fall and I haven't hired yet for that position. And that's a part-time position. I that is a part-time for students. Yeah. So it's, that one is, um, that one is 10 hours a week for the semester, for the term time, and 35 hours a week for the summer. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. So there may be some rushing of the mm -hmm. front of the room at the end. Well, <laughs> people want to introduce themselves. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us about this work. As Kayla said, it's such it's always a critical time. It's never we're feeling like, oh, phew, that's on, that's handled. Mm. Um, um, but thank you for the work and for coming to talk to us about it. It's great to see you again. You too. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the great questions. Yeah. Now let me let me turn this thing off and then talk to you guys for a second. Yeah.